The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus extol, his kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. We are looking at the church in a series of lessons and continuing one that we started earlier called Names for God's Church. We're going to look at a few of the names by which the church is called and also think about the implications of what those names mean for us. So let's go ahead and review very quickly the previous names that we looked at for the church in the Bible. The first name, the called out which refers to our call to leave sin and follow Christ. The word church in the Greek is ekklesia, which means the called out. God calls us to leave sin and follow Christ. The kingdom of God, which references our government. Christ is our king. He is an absolute monarch. And we have a government within the church that is an absolute monarchy. One king with all authority. We also are sometimes referred to as the body of Christ. The body of Christ. This refers to the fellowship and the cooperation that the members of the body are to have. And as the scripture describes our own physical bodies, it describes the eyes or the the nose and the feet and shows how they all work together. So we are members of the body of Christ to work together as well. In our lesson this time, we start off looking at another name called the household of God. The church is described as the house of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the Bible describes the church as the house of God. What implications does that have for us? What does that mean for us? To clarify, we're not talking about a physical building, but rather what we would call a household. A household references the people within the physical building, not the physical building itself. In Acts chapter 10, we see a reference to this type of verbiage, if you will, in verse 2, when it refers to Cornelius. Sometimes in the Bible, when it refers to someone's house, it's not really talking about their physical structure. It's talking about the people within. Cornelius is described as a devout man and one that feared God with all his house. That doesn't mean the physical brick or mortar or straw that he used feared God. It simply means that all those that were in his family, all those that dwelt in his house, they feared God, the people within. So similarly, if we're talking about the house of God, we're referring to the household. The household, which is the family of God. In uh, Ephesians chapter 1, if we were to notice verse 5, we realize this idea of family, that when we're saved, God adopts us within His family. In Ephesians 1, 5, this idea of adoption was something that came from quite a long time ago. God had planned this out. As a matter of fact, it says He predestinated us. Now that's not the idea of predestined as in you're going to either be saved or you're either going to be lost. What the verse is saying, he predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. This plan had been in effect even before the creation. He predestined that he was going to create man. Man he knew was going to rebel and sin against him. He would send a Savior, and that Savior would allow us to be adopted back into the family, into the presence of God. So, 
this idea of adoption we're very familiar with. A child who does not have a home, who is lost per se, no parents, is adopted, is placed within a home and now has a father, brothers, sisters, family. In uh, another verse reference of Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, Paul writes to the Romans about the attitude of Christianity, saying, we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but our attitude or our spirit is the spirit of adoption. We have been adopted into God's family, and he goes further to say, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, which is a personal, intimate type of reference to a father. Slaves within the first century were not allowed to speak to the father with the term Abba. We've talked about that before. That was only a term of endearment reserved for the children. And Paul here says we can now approach God the Father with that term of endearment because we have been adopted into his family. When we are added to the church, we are added to the household of God, God's family. John references this in 1 John 3, 1, the idea of adoption, because he simply says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. You remember the story of the prodigal son as he came to his senses and said, I'm going to go back to the father and I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me a servant. But we know the father said, Bring hither the robe, the ring, the fatted calf, because my son who was lost is now found. Yes, he would allow him back into the family, but not just as a servant, also as one of his own children. And that illustrates our very own uh, experience as well. We realize we are lost. We reproach the father and we say, Father, we've sinned. Just make me one of your servants. He says, you can not only be a servant, you can be one of my own children. You can be adopted into our family. And John references what love the father has given to us that that would be possible. So what we're talking about is the family of God. The household is the family of God. And since we're part of the family of God, we as the church are God's house or God's household. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, we read about this type of relationship here because it says, Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. We start to see the relationship, the people and the roles that are within the household. Jesus and Christ with us there in the family. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, You are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You're no no longer separated You're in with the family. So what are the roles within that family then? Well, just like an earthly family, a physical family, as a family we have a father. God the Father is our father. That's an easy one to figure out, right? God the Father is our father. In uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 9, Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. If God is our Father, then who is Christ? You already may have remembered seeing that from the book of Hebrews, that He's an older brother, a head over us. We understand that uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 says, the role that Jesus plays within the church is that He is head over us. But yet He functions as an older brother, if you will the first uh, uh, oldest son of the inheritance. In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Well, if he's head of the church, he's head of God's family. He's overseeing God's family. But of course, he does what is in accordance to the will of the Father. And the church is his body, the body of Christ. 
And as we saw in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we? We are the household of God. We are the family of God. And Christ oversees us as our family. And so Jesus Christ, we might say, is our older brother and the head over us. And we are the other brothers and sisters. And sometimes people use that reference. We say our brothers in Christ, our sisters in Christ. Well, that's pretty much the idea right there as a family. Brothers and sisters in Christ. As we saw in Hebrews 3, 6, Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we? We are the other members of the household. We are the other brothers and sisters within Christ. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, we see the same type of idea. Because ye are sons... God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Who receives the inheritance in our earthly families? Well, the family does, right? And and we read about in the Old Testament, it was like that too. The sons get the inheritance, the sons get the blessings, and therefore... If we are a son or a, or a daughter of God in the family, then we received an inheritance as well. We are heirs of God through Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, we read that ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Those that have obeyed the gospel, those that have been added to Christ, are now children of God and added to the church, which is His family. To be able to approach the Father intimately, you have to be a member of the family. To be a brother or a sister, you have to be a member of the family. To receive an inheritance, you need to be a part of the family. At the end of these lessons on the church, I keep emphasizing salvation is found only within the church. If you want an inheritance, you pretty much have to be a member of the family. We understand that on the physical sense, right? You don't just show up to the reading of a will of some guy you've never heard of and say, where's my portion? Because the attorney will just look at you and say, you're not a member of the family. What do you expect to get? How can we expect to get our inheritance to be brothers and sisters with, with each other and with Christ and to approach the Father intimately if we're not in the family. And what is the family? It's the church. How can we expect to have these blessings if we're not in the church? The second name we look at is the temple of God. The church is described as the temple of God. And what we talk about here, we're going to see is a little bit more toward the idea of worship and and fellowship with God. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. This gives us our really good imagery here that the church is the temple of God. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Do you see the imagery of a building being built? Jesus is a cornerstone. The apostles make up the rest of the foundation. And the writer here, Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, says, you are being built on top of that. You are the other bricks in the building, so to speak, this spiritual house being built in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. What are we when we come together as as Christians and we are resting upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and the apostles? We're the church, which is the temple of the Lord. We, as the church, make up the temple of the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. God dwells in His church. Why? Because the church is the temple. It is the building, the spiritual building, made up of all the individual members resting upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. 
When we talk about the temple, we're talking about the worship aspect of the church. The tabernacle and the temple were placed to worship God in the place where God dwelt. God dwelt among His people in the temple and the tabernacle in the past. Let's look at that in Exodus chapter 25. If we go to Exodus chapter 25, let's read verses 8 and 9. God says here in Exodus 25, 8 and 9, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. The instruction, make a tabernacle. Why? That I may dwell among you. Where did they go to worship God? Where did God come to talk to them? At the tabernacle. God dwelt among his people in the temple and the tabernacle of the past. And we also see that when Jesus came to live as a man among us, that was God coming down to dwell with us in the flesh. And in John chapter 1.14, he's described as dwelling among us. John 1.14 says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. If you look in the Greek, that word dwelt there means to tent or to encamp. Or is another word for God to reside in His tabernacle. Another way we could read John 1.14 is, The Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. Dwelt in a tent. What was that tent made of? The human body, the human flesh. It was God living in the human flesh and tenting or encamping with us. We sometimes may refer to our own bodies in that same sense. It's just a temporary tent, we tell ourselves, right? We're just passing through. We're pilgrims on this earth, just tabernacling, if you will, tenting on this earth because we know we're going somewhere else. And this body is not going to be my permanent dwelling, right? It's just a tent that I live in right now until later I move on. God dwells among His people today, as we saw in the church from Ephesians 2.22, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God. Do you see how this all fits together? If the church is the household of God then that's where he would dwell, right? Don't you dwell in your house? (laughs) I hope you do. If God dwells in his house, then what is his house? His house is the church. If God dwells among his people in the tabernacle or the temple, where is his temple today? It's the church. Where can we approach God and, and God dwells with us today? It's the church. The church, of course, worships God or we try to as best we can in spirit and in truth. As Jesus said when he was on earth in John 4, 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, our third and last name for the church that we look at now is the vineyard of the Lord. The vineyard of the Lord. This describes the work feature of the church. The church is not, as some may try to make it today, a social club or a place just for recreation. I heard a man tell me once that he said, well, you should come to, a woman had told him, you should come to where I go to church because they have really good donuts. Well, believe me, I'm not against donuts. (laughs) I am not against donuts at all. I like donuts. And it's not a sin to get together and eat some donuts. I don't know if, well, eating too many is maybe a sin. That's gluttony, but we don't, won't get into that right now. It's not a sin to get together and eat donuts. But I don't want to use that as my criteria for choosing which body I'm going to associate with and how I'm going to approach God in worship. No offense to this lady, but I'm not going to come to her church because she has good donuts. If I go to her church, I want to go there because it's the church that God built. And it's the church that I can be a part of and find my salvation. And besides, if I'm saved according to the Bible, 
Acts 2.47, God will add me to his church. And he will put me in the right place. And that's where I want to be. And so the church has many different features. But one thing we want to talk about now is there's work to be done. There's work to be done in the church. The church is described as the vineyard of the Lord. That implies work. There's a misconception sometimes floating around that, well, back Adam and Eve, when they were created, they were in paradise. They didn't have to do anything. You need to go back and read that again. Because God said put, he put them in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Man has always had work to do. And he still has work to do today. And when it comes to spiritual work, there is so much spiritual work that needs to be done. I don't understand people that talk as if they can't find any spiritual work to do. There is a lot of work that needs to be done. A vineyard is just that, a field of labor. And the Lord hires workers for his vineyard. As we saw, um, as we do see from the book of Matthew chapter 20, as we look at that, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, that's going to be their wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. And so when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the first unto the last. What's going on? There's a master of the vineyard, and he's got a lot of work that needs to be done. And he's going out and trying to recruit people to come into his vineyard and work. But you saw the first verse that says, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a vineyard. So what is he really referencing here? It's a visual illustration of the church. Jesus is our master and he hires us, so to speak. We join his vineyard in expecting a reward, a wage. And that wage is going to be the promise of eternal life that he's offered to us. But he doesn't expect us to just say, okay, now I'm saved. Now I'm just going to sit here on this nice cushy chair and wait for judgment day. He says, you need to go into my vineyard and you need to work. We work today in a spiritual field. Our job is to sow the seed, the Word of God. That was mentioned this morning. The seed of God is the Word. We get that from Luke chapter 8, verse 11, where the parable of the sower who went out to sow the seed. And Jesus lets us know the seed is the Word of God. And what good is the seed if it never gets sown? You know, there's a World Seed Bank over, I think it's in Norway. It's this kind of underground bunker. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's a place where they store seeds from around the world, apparently in case there's a apocalypse or nuclear war or whatever, that they can get the seeds out of this seed bank and re, you know, replant things so that these things aren't lost. Not necessarily a bad idea, but hopefully there never will be an apocalypse where, where we need that kind of thing. But the question is, what happens if we take seeds and we just put them somewhere and never do anything with it? Are we going to expect anything from the harvest? We'll never get it. Jesus told us in John four thirty five through 36... Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And then he goes on to say, 
He that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Do you see the different roles that people can play? Some sow the seed. Some reap what was already sown. Didn't Paul say something similar to that in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6? I have planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. There's different, different portions of labor that need to be done. I might teach a lesson and sow a seed. Five months later, somebody else may have a discussion with that same person and reap by having that person decide to be converted. And God at that time may give the increase. But the point is, we all have work that can be done. What did Jesus say before that? Look at the fields. They're white, all ready to harvest. There's so much work that needs to be done spiritually. People are dying and losing their soul every minute of every day. We have work that needs to be done. And the church is the vineyard of the Lord where we work sowing the seed. And we work together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 says, We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. You know what husbandry is? It's like a farm. Ye are God's building. Those who have a farm or have ever worked on a farm know that a farm takes a lot of work. So what is this verse saying? There's a lot of work that needs to be done for God. He will do His part. Rest assured, God will always do His part. But we have to do our part. Otherwise, what did Jesus say? Those that reap... And those that sow can rejoice together at the end because they both did their part. Do we want to see people saved? Do we want to see the church grow? Do we want to take more people to heaven? Then we better be doing our part. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God will do his part. We don't have to worry about that. The real question is, are we going to do our part? Are we going to be busy working in the vineyard of the Lord? Are you in God's church? Once again, I emphasize salvation can only be found there. Do you want to be in the household of God, the family of God? Then you need to be in the church because the church is the house of God. Do you want to receive the inheritance that the family members will get? You need to be in the household of God. You need to be in the family of God. Do you want to be able to approach God? And be part of the building in which he dwells. You need to be in the church, which is the temple of God. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. Or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org.